Everlasting by Nigel Robinson. The squat dog made eye contact with the tubby little man with the toothbrush moustache, seeming to take exception to his appearance. With a throaty growl, its lips slid back to reveal a silo of yellow teeth. On the thronged platform, waiting for the 758 to Liverpool Street, Morris Bloom said, I hope you're going to keep that thing under control. Standing next to him, the dog's owner, a skinny kid with ripped jeans and a tattooed face, was reading a heavy tombstone-covered paperback of horror stories. He was connected to the beast by a thick length of rope. The kid said nothing, gave the rope a jerk, and with the insolence of youth, looked through Morris as if he wasn't there. Morris wondered if his fellow traveller would take more notice of him if he were to slip off his beige corduroy jacket and let it drop to the floor. Perhaps he would react if Morris were to remove his polka dot tie and then teasingly, one by one, undo the buttons of his shirt before whirling it over his head and letting it fly away. But Morris felt a slight lurch of depression move inside him. He knew the thing the kid would remember most would not be his face or even his stripped teats. It would be the bruises. The yellow edged purple bruises that stained the skin of Morris's plump 50 year old body like Monet's water lilies. To hell with him, Morris thought. He pretended to ignore the glaring animals bristling back continued to read his out-of-date copy of the Times. But as the train slowed to a halt in front of him, Morris found he didn't want to move. The thought of going to work, spending yet another day in his stifling little office, keeping tabs on the supplies of paper clips and post-it notes, the everyday working trivia required by his betters, suddenly filled him with dread. His legs had grown unaccountably stiff, as if the mechanical parts, the bevels of his kneecaps, the ball and socket joints in his ankles, had become immovable, silted up with indecision. Two minutes later, alone on the deserted platform, he stood statue still, a self-marvelling monument to his own recklessness. He made up his mind. He wasn't going to go to work. He was going to go home. He was going to go home and murder his wife. <laughs> it was only a small decision. <laughs> Almost like something flitting out of the corner of his eye. An indefinable shiny trinket of thought that was without shape or form. But it was a thought that glittered with its own obvious logic. The equation was beautiful in its simplicity. Mrs. Bloom, alive and breathing, result, misery. Whereas Mrs. Bloom, not breathing and under the sod, result, happiness. <laughs> but though he wasn't a fan of detective fiction, Morris knew enough to understand that in the aftermath of a murder, it was vital to sustain a routine. Nothing should appear out of the ordinary to arouse suspicion. Once he disposed of Mrs. Bloom, he'd stick to his routine like glue. But for now, he needed time to think, time to plan. He knew that his immediate problem was how best to transfer his wife from this world to the next. Straightforward one-on-one -on -one combat wasn't an option. <laughs> Mrs. Bloom, a spindly, fleet-footed flyweight to his own plodding bulk, would sneeringly dance around him, her vicious right-hand jab, taking full advantage of the fact that she knew he was a gentleman, and therefore incapable of defending himself. No, Morris thought, as he ambled back down the station approach road, it would have to be something more subtle than simply beating the woman to a pulp. <laughs> he attempted to loosen his tightly knotted tie, 
but his chubby fingers couldn't find a pulling purchase. And there was the answer. Of course, it was simple. Wait until she'd eaten the evening meal that he always prepared for her. Wait until he'd put the usual gin and tonic in her liver-spotted hand. Wait until she was comfortably ensconced on the sofa, completely absorbed in one of her favourite TV shows. Then, on quiet, slippered feet, he'd approach her from behind. And with his tie, he throttled the woman into extinction. It was sad that it had come to this. He hadn't always wanted to murder his wife. Up until last year, he actually quite liked her. But she brought it on herself. A year or so ago, he noticed that Mrs. Bloom's eyes looked as if they'd been professionally polished. They had a gleam in them that he couldn't understand. And he was aware that she had a new, quietly simmering quality about her. Mrs. Bloom had found God. At first it didn't bother him. If it made her happy and kept her out of his way, then all well and good. But gradually her new demeanour, her new buzz and hubbub as she moved about the house, her alarming habit of bursting into a rousing chorus of all things bright and beautiful, had started to wear him down. And the smug, self-righteous, upward thrust of her jaw as she gazed into the distance got on his nerves. It was, he thought, as if she truly expected Jesus to appear on the horizon. And because of her own blameless life, she'd be one of the first to bask in his everlasting light. His everlasting light. That was the title on one of the cheaply printed pamphlets his wife had started to leave all over the house. Like a spreading plague, there was no escape from them. Much to his disgust, she'd even left information on how he could be saved in the lavatory. <laughs> Everlasting light, my ass, he thought. And at last, Monday's breakfast table, things had come to a head. After consuming his bacon and eggs, Morris had leant back in his chair and flapped open his paper. You shouldn't bother with that, Mrs. Bloom said. Morris asked her what on earth she was talking about. It's all nonsense. Nonsense and lies. He ignored her with a grunt from behind his barricade of newsprint. Mrs. Bloom stood, and like a conjurer, revealing that the rabbit had vanished, whipped the paper from his hands and tossed it over her shoulder. <coughs> this is what you should be reading, she said, spittle flecking from her lips. She thrust a small Bible into her husband's face. This is the word of truth. Rubbish. Mrs. Bloom slapped him in the face with the speed of a Venus flytrap. <laughs> and Morris sat dumbfounded, unable to work out what had happened. His wife stood back, her, her hand at her mouth. I am so dreadfully sorry, she said. Morris looked at his wife's face saucer-eyed with shock at what she'd done. But he could see that there was something else there too. At the corners of her mouth, there was an almost hidden detail, like something buried in the small print at the bottom of a contract. A tiny smile that said, you deserved that. You deserve that because you are a non-believer. Morris stood up with as much dignity as he could muster, his hand covering his stinging cheek. His wife had obviously gone mad, and he wasn't going to debate the issue of her newfound fanaticism, but he was going to have the last word. In a measured tone, as if he were underlining every syllable, he said, I still say it is all complete and utter rubbish. Mrs. Bloom attacked him with a vicious, pummeling energy he could only briefly marvel at. As her knotty little fists found the gaps in his flailing, defenceless parries, 
concentrating again and again on his face and ribs. He could remember thinking, this nonsense will stop in a second, <laughs> or the next, or the next one after that. And eventually, the battering did cease, and she let him slump back into his chair. He could hear the kitchen clock ticking in between his gasps for breath. What really made a lasting impression on him was just how hard she brought down the stiletto of her shoe down on his head. <laughs> when he returned to their neat bay-windowed celly, Morris thought there was something odd about the place. A faint air that didn't feel like home. It was the same feeling he used to have when he returned from a holiday abroad. The house was the same, but different. A heavy silence hung in the kitchen like a smothering shroud. There was no evidence of the mauling he'd received. Nothing except a cleansing tang of disinfectant that rose from the gleaming floor. His assailant was nowhere to be seen, but her Bible lay on the table where she left it. There was no time to lose. Whistling a happy tune, Morris walked briskly down the garden path between the smooth green lawn and fetched a shovel the shed. He didn't ponder over the spot. It didn't matter much because the plot was completely screened by high trees and shrubbery. You could sunbathe as naked as the day you were born without disturbing the sensitivities of the neighbours. He congratulated himself on his calmness. When Mrs Bloom returned, he would be waiting. He would be humble. He would apologise for his insulting behaviour. Apologise for deriding her faith. And he'd lure the woman into a false sense of security. Then he'd loop his necktie around her throat, knowing that her final resting place was all ready and waiting. As he put his foot on the spade and inserted it into the grass, he noticed, it, he noticed a faint, sweetly rotten smell that reminded him of a long-forgotten packet of sausages. Sausages that he'd once found going green in the back of the fridge. He dug deeper and saw a curled corner of white paper sticking up through the churned turf like some exotic flower, stark against the dark soil. Morris dropped to his hands and knees and with fanned fingers brushed away the loose bobbles of dirt. Gently, he pulled free a damp, sagging copy of the Times. And there he was, staring down at himself. His face, encased in a hood of earth, was grey and bloodless. His open, unseeing eyes were wetly collapsing into their sockets like empty jellyfish below the neat black hole in his head. He watched in fascination as a shimmering millipede weaved its way through his dead moustache. <laughs> the next morning, waiting for the 758 to Liverpool Street, the ugly dog near his feet growled up at him in greeting. I hope you're going to keep that thing under control, Morris said. The dog's tattooed owner said nothing, glanced past Morris's shoulder and gave its rope a tug. <laughs>